books let us into their souls and lay open to us the secrets of our own they are the first and last the most home felt and the most heartfelt of our enjoyments these beautiful lines from hazlitt's essay the sick chamber which he wrote towards the end of his life reflect very beautifully his love for books hello my dear friends i am neena sharma associate professor and head department of english meherjan mahajan devi college for women chandigarh and we shall be talking about william hazlitt today as an essayist william hazlitt was born in 1778 and his life span continues till 1830 so you can imagine that william hazlitt remains one of the most representative of the period called high romantic age at a time when french revolution was just a decade away when he was born and william wordsworth and coleridge were likely to bring about their lyrical ballads in 1798 20 years apart from his birth hazlitt was not only an essayist as i said earlier he was also one of the greatest literary critics of his times he was a painter a philosopher social commentator all rolled into one he is re- remembered as one of the best art critics of the romantic age he was a political liberal who was very sympathetic to the ideas of the french revolution and who can forget that most of the romantics were at some point or the other involved in all revolutions which were aimed at liberty equality fraternity not to miss the beautiful lines of wordsworth bliss was it in that dawn to be alive but to be young was very heaven the lines which he wrote for the french revolution hazlitt was quite influenced by the writers before him the writers like montaigne who is one of the most significant philosophers of the french renaissance and whose essays reflect his personal honesty his autobiographical anecdotes mixed with intellectual integrity and hazlitt's essays when we read we find the same kind of uh, merger of the personal with the intellectual He was also influenced by William Godwin who happened to be father of Mary Shelley. He was influenced by the political philosophers like John Locke, David Hartley, George Berkeley and Rousseau of course. Rousseau the great French philosopher that we are all familiar with for his ideas of the social contract, for his ideas about freedom and liberty. Edmund Burke who wrote extensively on French revolution and then coleridge of course uh, in fact hazlitt felt that coleridge was among the most intellectually stimulating conversationists that he had ever come across even though in some of his essays he has mentioned that coleridge's prose was dull and dreary so that was the kind of relationship that he had the ambivalence that he felt towards many writers of his times He was quite influenced by William Wordsworth as well and David Hume. And not to miss Charles Lamb with whom he was quite friendly and along with other Lake poets, uh, William Hazlitt, Coleridge and Wordsworth and Charles Lamb, they used to hang out together and indulge in various discourses of great intellectual intensity. some of the works which hazlitt is known for having written are an essay on the principles of human action and this as i said earlier he was quite influenced by william godwin so he was influenced by the essay written by william godwin and he uh, wrote an essay with the same undertones the round table was the collection of his essays with lay hunt who contributed 10 essays while hazlitt had contributed to the round table 40 essays of his own a very very prolific writer he wrote the collection called characters of shakespeare's plays and it's very interesting that in most of shakespearean plays hazlitt has written his essays 
and he also wrote a view of the english stage so he is one of the most important dram drama critics of his times he also wrote liber amoris or the new pygmalion in 1823 and the plain speaker which is a collection of most of his very very important essays and which he had written with tom pauline some of the other works very important work the spirit of the age which came out in 1825 and notes of a journey through france and italy in fact hazlitt along with his wife had traveled to distant lands he had gone to switzerland he went to most parts of the europe with his wife and from those recollections came out some of the most acute observations on human life and all its various hues and shades then he is credited with writing some of the very very uh, closely felt essays like essays on common sense originality the ideal envy and prejudice and all these essays appeared in the collection called the atlas which came out in 1830 as we know hazlitt's uh, a penchant for writing great essays was nothing new writers before him had experimented with this yonner and hazlitt was was quite influenced by dr johnson he appreciated dr johnson and he he carried forward the legacy of montaigne in fact bacon as well he was quite influenced by and he wrote analytical interpretative and literary compositions sometimes short some of them lengthy montaigne who influenced hazlitt used the essay as a means of self discovery and so did hazlitt his essays published in their final form in 1588 are still considered among the best and hazlitt had a great role model in montaigne the Uh, essay of hazlitt that we shall be focusing on is on reading old books and if we read the text the link for which i have given my my uh, listeners that they can always visit this link and read uh, the the entire text of the essay but there are certain things which i i thought would help you in understanding this essay better in fact uh, uh, hazlitt's essays do not have very strong literary pretensions a uh, very out of the world intellectual stimulation rather they come from his personal experiences his uh, joys his sorrows his very closely felt emotions and on reading old books is deeply deeply autobiographical because this essay reflects on the kind of books that hazlitt has fascination for and the the punch line of this essay is i have more confidence in the dead than the living so this is exactly what hazlitt goes on to prove in this essay on reading old books in fact he goes to the extent of saying that he finds it difficult to sit with a book which has recently been published this might come as a surprise but his arguments are very very strong in this uh, line because he believes that he would much rather read those books which have outlasted their contemporary value because that way he will not be wasting his time he will not be wasting his intellect on reading something which is yet to prove its um, authenticity its validation so some of the important references while reading old books because he he goes back and forth while while uh, suggesting that these are the particular books that he is uh, fond of and in the course of this essay he has made references to various new books as well which he feels that do not stand the test of time and therefore do not merit any attention also uh tales of my landlord L landlord as he uh, mentions in the very beginning uh, this was a subset of sir walter scott's waverly novels and uh, uh, hazlitt was quite uh, even though uh, walter scott was also writing almost around his time 1709 1713 uh, uh, almost at the beginning of the century 18th century 
But uh, uh, Hazlitt was quite impressed with uh, the, the beautiful depiction of the scenes, beautiful portrayal of the characters in Waverly novels written by Walter Scott. Uh, but at the same time, he goes on to undermine the works of uh, his contemporary writers like Lady Morgan, uh, who, who had recently at that time made waves with the wild Irish girl. And even though um, this, this novel was, was uh, quite uh, important for, for people in the elitist circles because uh, it catered to their, their uh, foibles, it, it was a reflection of their own foibles and uh, their own intrigues. But Hazlitt feels that this kind of works do not merit his attention. Uh, then uh, he, he refers to Andrew Miller, who had financed Dr. Johnson's dictionary and who was known for having some of the richest clients as a publisher. Uh, Harlow's uh, uh, reference also comes in uh, this uh, at the very beginning of this essay. And Harlow, uh, I would like to share with you, was a Secretary of State in Oliver Cromwell's government. And his reflections also uh, Hazlitt finds very, very erudite. Uh, Sir William Temple, uh, who was the first baronet, was an English statesman and essayist. Uh, but uh, much as Hazlitt appreciates the, the scholarly writings of these writers, these uh, statesmen, but he feels that he's more with Smollett and Fielding because they write some of the most gripping narratives. Uh, Smollett's Peregrine Pickle and Fielding's Tom Jones they remain some of his uh, all-time favorites, and he, he he recalls that he read Tom Jones uh, as as a serial form in in the um, daily, and he was quite impressed with the turn of events as they uh, they have been described by uh, Fielding. The Man of Mode he he refers to because uh, this was a restoration comedy by Etheridge. Um, and he refers to one of the minor characters who is Sir Fopling Flutter um, and who, who doesn't seem to have a stand of his own. So uh, Hazlitt feels that sometimes I feel like Sir Fopling Flutter, but then I, I feel that there is no uh, a comparison of Fielding's narratives or Smollett's gripping tales. Uh, he, he refers to another epistolary novel, The Sorrows of Young Werther by Goethe, uh, the German writer, and which had appeared as a revised edition in 1787. And he also refers to The Robbers, which was the first drama by Schiller, and it was published in 1781. Uh, because Hazlitt tries to uh, give examples of some of the works which were which had, he had tried to read and did not find them very interesting and certain works which had outlasted their contemporary value. Therefore, his, his uh, entire essay, six-page essay on reading old books is very rich in these references. These references will help you understand this essay better. Uh, he refers to Rousseau, uh, and, and it is with, with a very uh, infectious enthusiasm that he mentions that while a lot of erudition was being published and it was coming my way, but then came Rousseau and nothing to beat Rousseau, he feels, even though uh, it's uh, this novel that he talks about, the new Heloise or Julie, uh, this novel was uh, uh, not... Uh, expected to be read by the Catholics because uh, it was termed heretic and Rousseau as a champion of individual freedom had written this as uh, this novel, uh, Julie. Then he refers to uh, Clarendon's uh, History of the Great Rebellion, which was all about the three-year uh, three war, 18, uh, 1642 to 1644. And uh, of course, that was uh, biased in favor of the Puritans. So he feels that, yes, I, I could have read Clarendon, but all the time his inclination seems to be on good narratives. Uh, he refers to Chronicles also by Frossa, uh, uh, which are a 
a prose history of the Hundred Years' War, which happened between uh, between France and England. And uh, it was written by Froser, uh, who was a French historian. Uh, but uh, uh, Hazlitt ends with Beaumont and Fletcher, who he feels uh, remain his favorites because uh, this uh, 16th century duo had written some of the most beautiful uh, writings during the reign of James the One, and out of around 55 plays uh, in their folios, uh, he says that I have re- I have read only 12 or so. So uh, that that remains one of his uh, uh, much uh, looked forward to uh, reading venture. Uh, because this is this is a very very beautifully personal uh, essay uh, written by Hazlitt, so it is worthwhile to go through some of the excerpts from this um, uh, essay, uh, which which is an example of uh, in fact it's it's an example of Hazlitt's uh, enthusiasm uh, for uh, very beautiful uh, narratives, gripping tales and his his fascination for old books because they have proved their worth uh, in fact uh, uh, this this kind of personal autobiographical style puts him in the category of uh, the the greatest of the essays of all times uh, uh, see the, the the way he is uh, very enthusiastically mentioning his love for the old works he says, but the dust and smoke and noise of modern literature have nothing in common with the pure, silent air of immortality. So when he writes about the, the writers who are no more alive, but whose works have made them immortal, this is the ultimate tribute that he can pay to some of his um, uh, most loved writers. And he says, In thus turning to a well-known author, as he does, there is not only an assurance that my time will not be thrown away or my palate nauseated with the most insipid or vilest trash. Mark his words. The works which are newly written, they are almost like trash for him, but the pearls of wisdom which have been handed down by the ancestors, by the great masters of literature, uh, they seem like, like the whiff of fresh air to him. But I shake hands with and look an old, tried and valued friend in the face, compare notes and chat the hours away. So how personal, how closer home he feels when he writes about his love for the words which were written long back by the great masters. They bind together the different scattered divisions of our personal identity. So how books are not only the words printed on the page, they are also a testimony of the lived wisdom of the great uh, thoughts which have been handed down to posterity by the great masters. They are landmarks and guides in our journey through life. So that didactic purpose of literature also comes alive in Hazlitt's essays. They are, he says, the tokens and records of our happiest hours. They are for thoughts and for remembrance. So how great works of literature, the old ancient works of literature, they remain the, 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 uh, like trophies which have been handed down to the generations. For myself, not only are the old ideas of the contents of the work brought back to my mind in all their vividness, but the old associations of the faces and persons of those I then knew of the air, the fields, the sky, return, and all my early impressions with them. So when one is going through a book over and over again, because Hazlitt does mention that there are around 20 volumes in his uh, reading shelf, which he goes on reading over and over again. And every time he reads, it gives him a new pearl of wisdom. 
it takes him back to the time when he first read this work so uh, reading is is a pleasure which not only broadens our imaginative frontiers but also uh, becomes a nostalgia in its own right so he says sweet is the dew of their memory and pleasant the balm of their recollection so no wonder his love for old books remains forever it is perennial it is eternal and there is nothing to to stop him from loving the old books because with them come a flood of memories and the great wisdom at the same time and he he talks about some of the great masters of language like edmund burke uh, edmund burke who had written very extensively on the history of french revolution Uh, reflections on the french revolution uh, hazlitt uh, does go to him for very scholarly insights on the french revolution but he feels that his style was forked and playful as the lightning crested like the serpent he delivered plain things on plain grounds so there is there is no intellectual pretension but things as they are on ground if there are greater prose writers than burke they either lie out of my course or study or are beyond my sphere of comprehension so his love his obsession for the writings of the great old writers that is uh, unparalleled for him edmund burke remains one of the most important one of the most significant writers and uh, he mentions in this essay that coleridge had mentioned to him that wordsworth has written some great prose and he says till that time i had not experienced how wordsworth was writing his prose so he he doesn't uh, appreciate much but later on of course he uh, felt that wordsworth was also one of the 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 greatest writers but at the same time he had a grouse against wordsworth that he did not follow up the ideas of french revolution and was given into the politically right thinking so he says i intend whenever i can to read beaumont and fletcher all through there are 52 of their plays and in the last slide i have mentioned around 55 because uh, 55 uh um, plays they are combined from both the folios and a couple of them were printed later on outside the folios so he says there are 52 of their plays and i have only read a dozen or 14 of them so his heart lies with the gripping tales good prose and uh intellectually uh not not pretentious but personal and very anecdotal Uh, style of writing uh there is another uh, essay which is in our syllabus uh for uh, post graduate students apart from on uh, reading old books uh on gusto is another work that uh, very very uh, short essay of around 3 uh, pages or so uh, this essay the text of which i have given the link you can access the the link and read the entire text which is very short and very crisp and very uh, beautifully in a racy narrative it has been written so uh, what how how does hazlitt define gusto he feels that gusto in art is power or passion defining any object and for him this is one of the most important qualities which he would demand of a great writer if a writer is not passionate about what he is writing uh, hazlitt would not consider him among the best writers and no wonder uh, when we talk about keats negative capability which he uh, referred to in, um, in respect of shakespeare uh, we feel that it is the same kind of uh, passion that he was also perhaps referring to as hazlitt is talking about the passion which shows in the paintings and in writings both and this essay is replete with a number of allusions 
to the Italian painters, to the Flemish painters, Dutch painters, Baroque tradition, um, great, great painters who have uh, made a mark for themselves in various uh, different ages. Uh, but it is their passion which comes alive, as Hazlitt says, through their paintings. And if they, they, their works reflect that passion, then Hazlitt considers them the great, right, great painters. So he refers to Rubens, who makes his flesh colors like these are the excerpts from On Gusto. So Rubens was a Flemish painter um, who uh, he, he feels uh, that his paintings, uh, in his paintings, he, uh, the flesh that he paints the, of human uh, uh, figures, it looks like flowers. Albano makes his flesh look like ivory. But Titian, Titian is a great Italian painter who Hazlitt has a strong fascination for. So Titian's paintings are like flesh and like nothing else. So he feels that Titian's paintings are what make him uh, feel that they have been painted with gusto and therefore they stand out in comparison to the Flemish uh, painter Rubin and Alibano. In a word, gusto in painting is where the impression made on one sense excites by affinity those of another. So the moment one looks at Titian's paintings of human flesh, uh, one feels that yes, it is flesh. So it leads to uh, the sense of touch as well. But in other painters, Hazlitt feels that gusto is missing. Then Michelangelo's forms, he says, are full of gusto and everybody would appreciate the great paintings that Michelangelo has painted. He says, whenever we look at the hands of Correggio's women or of Raphael's, once again Italian painter, we always wish to touch them. Why? Because they have also been painted with gusto. They have also been painted with passion by the painter. Titian's landscapes, he says, have a prodigious gusto. If he paints flowers, his flowers seem real. If he paints the, the um, uh, green uh, 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 um, uh, um, grass, the grass looks uh, lush. If he paints the, the blue skies, his blue sky feels immense and uh, real. Then he gives example of Rembrandt. Rembrandt, once again, the Italian painter, has it in everything, he says. Everything in his pictures has a tangible character. Therefore, these, these painters for him, they stand apart because of their passion, because of the magical touch of their brush. Claude's landscapes, perfect as they are, want gusto. They do not interpret one sense by another. So Claude, again, a, a painter whose uh, mm, uh, fawns and satyrs are some of the most important paintings. We will only mention one other work, he says, which appears to us to be full of gusto, and that is Beggar's Opera. So uh, Hazlitt goes from one art form to another. From painters, he goes to John Gay's Beggar's Opera, which was an opera written in the 16th century uh, in three acts. It was in, in ballad form, poetry ballad form, and uh, it was later on uh, uh, given the form of opera. And he feels that because that opera, because the music in, in this opera is so very sensitively, so very beautifully uh, caught, captured, Therefore, this work is, he says, the one which shows uh, the greatest gusto. Uh, from these two essays uh, the, uh, on reading old books and on gusto, we realize that Hazlitt's essay, uh, essays have, have a distinct narrative style. And what is that distinct narrative style? They have a very strong personal note and he seems to be speaking to his readers like the long-lost friend. 
there is self expression personal anecdotes personal memories he goes through personal preferences his predilections for a particular kind of uh, portrayal and a particular kind of explanation he keeps gliding into the past more focused on ideas than on the form hazlet well, did not have any intellectual pretensions and therefore his prose is is almost like conversation he uses extensive aphorisms paradoxes epigrams in fact when we read uh, his essays we keep going back and forth in narration he uses very evocative descriptions and very very evocative imagery also his essays they reflect the prose style much like orwell who came later in the 20th century his essays do have very terse and vigorous sentences he presents abstract ideas in concrete forms and what stevenson says um, about hazlet seems true uh, without a doubt that though we are mighty fine fellows nowadays we can't write like william hazlet so his prose style uh, in spite of being very personal in spite of being very autobiographical it has been appreciated and he is no wonder he has uh, reserved a place for himself among the best uh, writers of uh, essays these are a few suggested readings which i would like you to go through and here is the link of the pdf uh, on um, an an article on william hazlitt and his art um, from academia and and these books the logic of passion uh, and uh, the mind of a critic these are not only on hazlitt but in a way these these books trace the journey of essay as a as a literary uh criticism essay as a literary form in english literature so i would strongly recommend these uh, books uh, for further reading and to get a better view of hazlitt's essays uh, and his his prose style and i wish you all happy reading and uh, uh, we can um, uh, continue uh, with another tutorial on uh, uh, another writer sometime soon so with these words i sign off and we shall meet again in the next video thank you so much